is everyone doing? Okay, so on the beautiful morning on Monday, I'm gonna talk to you about what the usual Friday when we have an incident looks like. If I can enable my clicker. There you go. So, on a beautiful Friday afternoon, it was like late, 4 p.m. or something, we got an email from our colleague from our department, and he was like, hey, Infosec. So I got this email, and it looks kind of fishy. Like, it looks kind of bad. Something in this email that he received was wrong. And the email went like this, hello, Mozillians, yada, 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 something interesting there signed as the chair of the Mozilla Foundation. We would like to know what you think about whatever it is. And we are asking employees to provide some kind of feedback. Click here. If this does not look fishy, but I'm not sure what does. So you were taken to the uh, landing page and this landing page asked you to log in. Now, which one is the original Mozilla login page and which one is the fake Mo Mozilla login page. So very like one detail in the address and that's it. So someone did like a really hard job to mimic our login page. At this point, you know, you have an incident. So we were like, eh, that's probably like the red team. We are fishing our people on a regular basis. That's red team. And the red team was, no, it's not us. Oops. So where goes your Friday? So when dealing with incidents like this, the most important stuff is uh, timing. And I have to say that contrary to most reports uh, that tell that within like five to 15 minutes after sending the phishing email, people usually click on it. For us, for us it was like two and a half hours. Maybe it was because the email targeted like a very selective group of people that makes it even, even more suspicious. Like only 20 people, less than 20 people out of over 1,000 of employees. So someone did the homework here. And uh, we looked when the first DNS lookup uh, happened after someone clicked on the phishing email, on, on the link from the phishing email. And you know what? It, it, it does pay off if you if you're gonna like fish your own people. If you it does pay off, you're doing these kind of security trainings because the first person, thank you, uh, that clicked on uh, the phishing email link did not fall for it, but reported it to us as phishing. So yeah, red teaming our own people pays off. But we had some victims, and when you cut yourself, it's kind of like incident response. You are slicing something in the kitchen, you cut yourself, so you have to like clean the wound, stitch yourself in more or less good way, stop the bleeding, and then you can only think if you are going to the emergency response or not. For us, it was kind of like um, uh, looking at Gmail logs and moving the phishing email from users' inboxes. So when doing this kind of detection, it really helps to have multiple data sources. So there we go. Uh, I'm not advertising Gmail, but it's a centralized email solution. So whatever is centralized helps for things like this. Uh, we identified who received this email and who clicked on the phishing link. Now it's very important to say that there might be more victims than people that just received the email. Because people, at least from our experience, they share phishing emails they share phishing links. So they are like, hey, like to the person sitting next to them, they're like, hey, have you seen this link? And they forward the link over a different channel, like uh, social media, and there will be more victims than just people who receive the email. Authentication logs, you identify who the attacker is, you identify where the attacker breached in, and we started the standard procedure, standard response. You blog, you monitor, you add the uh, attacker's infrastructure to your monitoring, so when the attacker tries to log in, you are getting critical alerts. Uh, we locked account for every person that went that fallen for this phishing, and we killed every session that attacker established. And by the way, everything here happened with MFA enabled on every hour service. People were just receiving 
pop up on the phone from nowhere, hey, please uh, acknowledge this MFA login. And they were not trying to log into anything before, but they were like, oh, I have a pop up to uh, sign in via MFA. Okay, yes, acknowledged. So much for the MFA. Uh, timing is everything, timing is important. Uh, we kicked the threat actor out in less than 20 minutes. Uh, we got our free pizza. Everything ended up well. And uh, so for this story, uh, it fortunately ended up really well. Uh, it highlights here that it does help to have some kind of like a phishing training because we did not detect this kind of behavior. This behavior was, uh, was um, tipped to us by one of our employees. And why? Uh, because we had one of our alerts broken. I mean, it happens. Our attacker spent uh, a month preparing this infrastructure. As you can see, it was kind of like exhaustive. They had like 20 something domain names to like cause the full copy of our uh, SSO infrastructure. And interesting thing that they did, when they realized we got them, they started clicking on every single application on the SSO panel, trying to establish as many sessions to as many internal systems as they could find from every account they compromised. So we had to like, well, it helps to have SSO, so we had to like kill every session that attacker established. So lessons from this one, have the access that you need. And if right now you are thinking, hey, in my organization, who is the person that can like, manually inspect the Gmail logs, email logs, Office 365, something like this, who has administrator permissions to remove phishing emails from users' inboxes, I want you to think about it. Because when the incident strikes, we'll be looking for it in the middle of the night. Water break. For me, water break. So, uh, there is another story, much shorter. Uh, we are doing our threat hunting exercise a uh, couple times per week. Sometimes we find people doing strange things, our Mozillians doing strange things, but this server, it doesn't matter what the alerts are here, but what this server did, I saw something that was scanning internal networks and it was talking to known malware domains and it was doing it with a broken SSL. What do I mean by broken SSL? I mean a self-signed certificate, weak cyber suit, not the usual perfect SSL that you get from your browser. Something was off. Uh, our fingerprinting system for SSL told us that it never saw a connection like this. And when I was about to classify it as a classic malware example, I saw this host uploading over one gigabyte to Dropbox. So you have a host scanning internal networks, talking to bad people, and uploading to Dropbox. Yeah, you have an incident. Uh, just a quick glance at like the failed or rejected connections. Uh, all of these diagrams that you see here are like failed connections to our internal infrastructure. So something was really trying to propagate. And when I was investigating, I started looking at like metadata. And when investigating any incident, any behavior of a compromised and suspicious host, it's extremely important to uh, investigate everything in the context those things are happening. Here, I saw that this compromised host was sending SNMP requests to our network devices. And if it's an sysadmin, okay, maybe they are doing something, but it was someone from the finance department. How frequently do you see people from the finance department sending SNMP to your firewalls. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately for this story, we never quite figured out what it was because when we reported it to the end user services, which are responsible for uh, managing of the desktop fleet, we were like, hey, this laptop, there is a malware on it. We want to inspect it. And they were like, okay, we took this laptop and we wiped everything off it and we destroyed every malware that was on this laptop. This laptop is now clean. Uh, this is not what you do because they just destroyed the evidence and we never got the patient zero, even we, if we could. So the rule number one of incidents, never reinstall anything. Just get the machine delivered straight to your desk. 
why am I telling you all of this? Uh, quoting Jack R. from Twitter, every intrusion introduces an anomaly into your environment. And this env uh, anomaly can be catched. Uh, I know, I'm not sure that you can read it from the end of the, of the room, but there basically is a sign uh, at the bottom left corner that says it, it basically shows like all the procedures, what to do uh, if something happens. Uh, but at the end it says, if there is a huge fuck up, just call this person. So that's unfortunately where our incident response looked like for like a number of years. We had a uh, network, uh, network operation center called Mozilla Operation Center responsible for triaging alerts. Unfortunately, they just always called me. So. And to help you understand how we migrated from this, uh, it is important to introduce the cultural piece within Mozilla. Uh, some of you might know the web page, Are We Fast Yet? Which was the web page showing how uh, fast the Firefox is and is it like fast enough for people to use it comfortably? Uh, what I did not know a week ago is that we used to have many more of these sites. Like, are we fun yet? Are we pretty yet? Well, I don't know about them. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Uh, are we Chrome yet? I mean, why? Are we dead yet? Okay. So our security team came up with something called, are we owned yet? How many of you would like to have a website, well, well alert triaging uh, system that calls are we owned yet? And it, the idea for this name came from like our director of security. Uh, alert analysis and response duty uh, on a given day, a person assigned. When we started with it, there were many challenges. Uh, the first one, probably most of you who ever did any kind of defense know very well, you have too many alerts. Uh, you have alerts that are only good in some context. And unfortunately, a skilled threat actor looks quite, quite like a sysadmin, and sometimes a sysadmin can look like a threat actor. So there's kind of like a problem here. And I don't know about you, but we have these systems where I sometimes am like during the threat hunting sessions, let's investigate this system. There are no alerts for it. There is no reason to believe it's owned, but I know the configuration of this system, like it's got to be owned. Like there are attackers on this system. I don't have any evidence. I just have a gut feeling somewhere deep in my stomach. So when you have too many alerts, and yes, this is a screenshot from our SIEM system, uh, and those creatures are our threat actors. Uh, when you have too many alerts, that's what happens. Basically, everyone like acknowledges everything and people don't really look much at it. So we decided to change it a little bit and do some kind of like a correlation and go in a smart way, investigate alerts in like the context to minimize the number of alerts without losing the detection. So we started looking at techniques to do it. And for example, one of the problems that we saw uh, during uh, investigations, during uh, alert triaging, is that there are many things that you want to know about that happen on your system. Uh, like someone is adding a new scheduled job in Windows, a new cron job on Linux, a new systemd job on Linux. You do not want to alert every, every time your sysadmin adds a new cron job, but unfortunately that's also the primary way uh, malware of all sorts of ki and, and kinds uh, achieves persistence on your system. On, on Windows, it's almost exclusively new service being created or a service being overridden. So we approach it in two ways. We include it in threat hunting and we have like a low level alert that no one triages on a daily basis, but like twice a week, it's part of the report that we generate. And we look at it and we are like, what is this new crunch of doing here? There are obviously many, many more uh, examples here. The reason to do contextual alerts, the reason to have low fidelity alerts that you will investigate later is you will see behavior that you want to catch in many places, uh, in many like rootkits for Linux, for example, that we investigated. 
This one from here, it comes from APT28. And what you can see here, there are actually a lot of ways to detect this kind of stuff. Hey, you just created a new file in the slash bin and there should be no rsync d in slash bin. There should be no, there is a new system d created. Uh, this malware writes to what is called TCB, which is a trusted computing base. Trusted computing base is a part of the system that basically uh, should be not changing much and every change in the trusted computing base should be coming from the uh, package manager, like slash bin slash as bin. If something else than the package manager writes to there, uh, yeah, you might want to take a look. Uh, and this malware also writes to like unique destinations, uh, communicates with unique destinations. So this is my personal opinion. It does not represent Mozilla Corporation, but I looked at the rootkit from uh, APT28 and I'm very proud to announce APT28, I hope you are listening. You're lame. You're so incredibly lame. Like seriously, APT. Like be APT and do not write rootkits that look worse than like Bitcoin miners. I literally saw more stealthy Bitcoin miners than most rootkits from like those Linux rootkits from like APT groups. Uh, so are, are fortunately like most analysis. And by the way, another message to APT28, if you are going to use the, you're going to find the CNC server name for your next project, do not use Mozilla plugins. Do not use anything connected to Mozilla, okay? It's just not cool. So when I was looking through attackers tactics, attacker rootkits, attacker malware, I was like, but we are just a couple of defenders. We are not one of these people who investigate alerts 24 seven in something like FireEye when they see attacks from all around the world. We do not have access to the same data. So where do I get those tactics that I'm about to be defending against from? So I started looking in, right. okay. So I started looking at uh, APT reports and started reading them one by one, especially APT reports for Linux. And I will tell you that reading APT reports for Linux is like a journey in time. It's like going all the way to 90s, which is interesting. Every single time I was reading some APT report, I was like, I have seen these tactics before, but where? So, we started digging and I discovered that most of these backdoors, most of these rootkits actually come from just a handful of sources. So what most APTs right now, this might change in the future, but right now what most APTs do is they copy and paste rootkits from all the uh, frag zine. So I hope some of you here remember frag. I was downloading first frag editions at like 56K modem or something older. And when you take a look at what those rootkits look like, uh, it's like very nothing special. A while ago, there was the, quite the news uh, all around the world about, hey, there is this invisible rootkit for Linux that nothing can detect. It like hides itself from sysadmin tools. So I looked at it and it turns out that the, it's also APT28, just uses the old uh, LOKI2 or Luki rootkit that was published in FRAC in like 90s. And I just modified it to like modern systems so it still works. It does nothing special. It just hides itself on a user level that we will talk about in a couple of seconds. It just sniffs the raw network traffic and it exfiltrates data using ICMP. How do you detect a rootkit like this? We'll talk about it, but you look for something opening a raw access to your network traffic. You look for some hosts that send enormous amounts of ICMP messages. This one is, for example, spamming like crazy. Uh, 
the one rootkit that is currently being used by most of the state actors for Linux, it's Azazel. It's, it again comes from, I think, like a private research company. They just wrote something called an open source rootkit. Uh, I don't write open source rootkits in my free time. They do. And again, it's not complicated at all. What it does, it installs itself or of, uh, in your system as a LD preload, uh, in a, using the LD preload mechanism. So what it means, it drops a library. It does not drop a service. It drops a library in your slash lib directory. And it writes a configuration to slash etc slash LDSO preload. So this library is preloaded in front of any library for any process of the system that starts. So this way, this uh, rootkit is able to inject itself on a user space level into every program that you have. What it does, again, nothing interesting. It basically hooks the accept function. And it's like, hey, if the source port is some magic number, then start a shell. So yeah, nothing special. So I wrote a small uh, code, a piece of code that detects the presence of like user space rootkits. The code is published later and there will be links in the, in the presentation. No problem detecting it. And I will talk how I detect it in a couple, in a couple of minutes. Uh, another rootkit, this one is a little bit smarter. It's again, level three rootkit, which is user space, which are all the current APT rootkits these days. Again, it's LD preload. It hooks uh, every single syscall to hide itself from the investigator. It hooks the Linux spam library to bypass the authentication if, if you provide some secret, so secret magic in the authentication process. It's like, I know you, you gave me the secret handshake, whatever, root shell for you. And what it does, it sniffs packets from the network and if it can see the TCP packet with some interesting fields set to like some combination of values, it will connect back to the source of this TCP packet. So that's kind of what it does. Uh, when I was detecting this root feed with my uh, technologies that I was super proud of, uh, I suddenly wasn't feeling too smart. Because uh, after detecting Azazel in five minutes, I was like, I cannot detect this one at all. Why? Huh. Because uh, it actually hooks all the functions that I use in my detection. So it's as if the rootkit was fighting with me, because the rootkit authors are not that lame as a PT28. They actually know what, what they are doing. They know the detection methodologies and they try to bypass them. They try to hide actively from the detection. So um, if you want to talk in details about uh, this way of detection later, just catch me around. But basically here, uh, what my code does, and I did not come with this idea. The idea comes from the choke point .net. Uh, you write a code where you tell the code, hey, go ahead and open the library and give me addresses of symbols in this library. Save it to the site, then look up addresses of these symbols in the current process space. So those lists should be even. Like no matter how you load a, a library in the current process, all of these symbols in Linux should be at the, at the same addresses. If you have rootkit running in your system, those addresses will be different. So, okay, that's pretty easy to to detect. Unfortunately, it did not work so well for one of our rootkits. So I started looking for some alternative ways of detection. And I was like, you can actually detect a rootkit on the Linux systems because they were written by people who make mistakes and it's really difficult to hide on the operating system. So every rootkit tries to hide the fact that it's written something to etc LDSO preload to preload itself into every process by hiding the file. So you try to open the file and your Linux is like no such file or directory. Okay, you list the directory contest, uh, the etc, and Linux is like, there is no such file. But you try to write into this file and the rootkit will also respond with no such file or directory. That's a dead giveaway because you should not have message telling you that the file does not exist 
permission denied when you're trying to write into a file that you have permissions to write to. So uh, some rootkits actually capture the S trace and they return an error anytime you try to S trace something to deny the system and administrator's ability to investigate. I mean, that's pretty stupid because it's like a dead giveaway. I have permissions to S trace something. I cannot S trace anything. I'm going to investigate it. And obviously, Linux libraries, they move faster than rootkits. There will also be new system calls or new implementations of system calls that rootkit authors forgot to detect. So I was playing with the undetectable Amberon, which hooks the function that I use for detection. And every time I was uh, running my code, what this rootkit does, if it detects someone doing the, my style of detection, running the DLC functions, it will return you the address to the original clean function that does not have rootkit injected into it. So you investigate it and you get the clean function, there is no rootkit, everything is fine. But, so does it mean there is no detection? No. As you can see, it returns the address to the original function when you try to investigate it. Hey, so how about we use this address of the original function, find two functions that I need, which is open a file and read from the file. And sure enough, if you try to open the process maps space using uh, on a system that is root fitted with Amberon, uh, you will not get any information about the root rootkit library being preloaded because it filters the output. But because it just gave me the address of the original function, which is clean, I can use this function to read the process maps file and I can find that in my process some interesting library was preloaded. I don't know about your system, but I do not have this kind of like slash user slash lib slash random string lib c being loaded. So the point is there are always way to detect rootkit, you just have to read the source code. Lessons learned so far. It's very difficult to make a rootkit on a Linux system invisible. All of them have bugs. Some of them try to resist the detection, but the resisting of the detection can be the indicator of being backdoored. So it's kind of like a both ways sword. And a couple of days ago, uh, again, uh, there was another news about some Chinese groups, a part of the Winty project using uh, another undetectable Linux rootkit. It's not undetectable, it's Azazel again. Uh, quick lessons learned, most APT groups are more persistence, persistent than advanced. Uh, you should be looking for commonalities when you are trying to detect them. You should be identifying patterns, you should be looking for things to correlate and some unusual behavior. Yes, it does require an expert level knowledge for Windows, Linux, whatever systems you are investigating because you need to know what you should be expecting and what you are getting in the, in the return. Uh, another thing that we learned is that threat actors, they use public tools all the time. In, in most of the bridges, you will see someone using Mimikatz for Windows. I mean, Mimikatz is great. It avoids many frauds of detection. It works. It will dump the credentials. Why not use it? And for Linux, yeah, just a couple of open source rootkits. All technologies and procedures uh, are fresh. So most of these APT groups, because no one or almost no one has a reliable detection for rootkits on the Linux systems, they don't have to go far. They just have to find something that works and minimize the development cost, minimize the operation cost. So if there is something in old frag that works, why not use it? Most analyzes are pretty lame. Mm, I saw this analysis from Kaspersky and Kaspersky was like, this Linux rootkit, it does not run as a root user, but it can install itself in a persistent way, bypassing the root protections, whatever it is for them. And it's able to sniff the raw network traffic without having root permissions. First of all, 
uh, Kaspersky uh, analytist was running the rootkit as a root user, but just didn't know about it. It kind of shows what kind of level of uh, Linux skills they have. And also, they probably never heard about capabilities on Linux system. Uh, the one that I think Ars Technica was writing like two days ago, the Chinese invisible rootkit, everyone was like, uh, the whole community for Linux has a problem because there is new rootkit for Linux that evades antivirus detection. Okay, when was the last time you used antivirus on your Linux system on a server trying to detect uh, advanced malware? I don't remember doing it. So, following this, we decided that we need a new systematic approach. Now we know what kind of methodologies there are, what kind of tactics there are, uh, what kind of things we want to be looking for. So we decide to revamp and redesign our detection process. And the first thing that we started with was auditing our visibility. If you want to catch all of these things, if you want to catch those threats, uh, you have to know what you can see and what you cannot see so you can plug your visibility gaps. Only and only when you know what you can see, you can follow up with all these trendy and interesting topics like automating, enriching, hunting, whatever. First, you need the data source. So everyone knows the ATT attack framework. It's excellent, I like it. Uh, that's where we started with. And we had this idea, hey, how about we use this ATT attack framework uh, and map our data sources and our detection on top of it to see what kind of technologies we can detect. Unfortunately, the ATT framework, it's heavily Windows focused. Most of the uh, attacks for Linux are old. Now that you know that many of these old attacks actually still work, that's actually not too bad because most attacks for Linux are also in the 90s. And it's not detailed enough. What I mean is in the uh, attack framework, you will, for example, see the uh, attack technology that someone uh, just creates a local account on your system. Okay, but I can create a local account using user ad. I can use my custom binary. I can open and write to the slash etc slash passwd. Or, so the attack framework is a good starting point, but you need to go deeper. And for each detection uh, techniques and tactics, you need to think about multiple ways the attacker might take multiple paths the attacker might take to achieve this result. There are many tools to help you detecting what you can see and what you cannot see. I highly recommend if you go on GitHub and look for the Atomic Red Team. It basically is a set of scripts that you run on your systems. And it will tell you, hey, if I execute PowerShell in my environment, do I have logs generated for it? If I execute some magic TCP dump command on a Linux, does, do I have like information in my SIEM database? Uh, yeah, so we mapped our data sources to TTPs. The reason for this slide is you will not be able to read the next three slides because you know there is a lot of data on them. But when Confidence publishes this talk and these slides, there will be links to full version, full resolution samples. But what I'm saying by mapping your the data sources on top of the attack framework is something like this. So for example, we have our network security monitoring and we mapped what the network security monitoring data can do for detection. And what you cannot see is, hey, it's excellent tool for like detecting the command and control because it does have this data for detecting command and control. Uh, we mapped the ODD JSON. And now we know what kind of attacks we can detect with the data from ODD JSON. We did it for syslog as well. And we did it for authentication data. And we did it for many more types of data. After we mapped every single data source on top of the attack framework, we also mapped every single alert that we have to the top of the attack framework to see where do we have gaps. Because we don't have some kind of data, because our alert is noisy, and so on and so forth. Uh, I do not have the slide with our alerts being mapped on top of the uh, ATT framework because that's 
quite obviously not something that we want to share with attackers. So, but the lesson from here is do map your detection on top of the ATV attack framework and you know, something interesting might happen. Only when you know what kind of data sources you have and you know what kind of data sources you need, you execute threat actors tools. And you see what those threat actor tools actually, what kind of logs are generated. So you execute mini cuts and you are like, okay, this is what I'm getting. And also, this is what I'm not getting based on some Twitter conversations. So you see what logs are generated, not generated. You go back to the design phase. You include some new data sources. So that's kind of interesting because you know I like to collect good kids. So speaking about executing threat actors tools, uh, there was this news uh, about like a internet auction on eBay. Someone was selling super stealthy malicious laptop with like six root kits on it. And there was a lot of press about it. I was like, okay. So this is what I have. And there is nothing special about it. There is like, there are like root kits from pretty much and exploits from pretty much every APT group around. It takes 10 minutes to find them on the Tor network and it takes 10 minutes to find them on GitHub. So, and to find the address from the Tor network, uh, you will just go to Twitter. So, why not? By the way, you should see the face of my boss when I was downloading all of this. And my boss was like, I just hope that, because I live in the US, uh, and you, when you cross the American border, they sometimes inspect your laptop. So he's like, I really hope at no point anyone inspect your laptop. Because if they find this, they're going to think you're some kind of like a spy or something. Like those people do not understand this part of the job. So yeah, more, more, more. Uh, after being severely disappointed, I decided to write my own rootkits and started asking questions on a generic level. If I want to detect them, what does a Linux rootkit do? Well, it has to install itself and it has to achieve some persistence. Installation, obviously, somewhere in the system. Mm, persistence usually achieved using some cron job system D timers, similar stuff, or overwriting something that is already on the system. Unfortunately, all of the APT groups disappointed me in a heavy way, and none of them did any of these advanced attacks that uh, people like the author of GR security are talking about. We have not identified anything like this in the wild, like no one wants to do it. And one thing we learned and why we focus so much on the installation phase, your malware might be, might be advanced enough, you will not be able to detect it post fact. It doesn't matter, detect the steps that lead to the installation and maybe you will be lucky. So when it comes to the installation, every rootkit has to either save itself to a temporary directory, or like most of them do, they write to what we call the trusted computing base, which is part of the system that should be modified by the package manager only. We monitor every write to things like slash user, slash bin, slash fbin, slash lib, by anything which is not a package manager. We intercept every execution and we lock every execution using our ODD plugin. And there will be a link to this plugin at the end of the talk. Uh, and we look for things like, hey, execution from slash TMP directory or execution from slash run. That's interesting. We also look at unusual process names, which is also helpful. Uh, unusual processes run. You need to have visibility to tell you, hey, across all of my fleet, how, uh, what kind of the least common processes that I have. But that's also what we hunt for. Uh, when it comes to detecting persistence, just a quick glance uh, for every persistence detection uh, methodology, there is a detection methodology for it. Um, cron jobs, system D services. Important thing to remember is to monitor creation of new scheduled tasks, uh, new cron jobs, new system D services, and so on but also monitoring integrity of the files themselves. Because the malware might not be creating a new job, it might be overwriting something that is already on your, on your disk. Uh, 
when it comes to detecting advanced persistence, uh, like I said, the slides are going to be published later. I just wanted to like put so much detection as I could think of without like talking about everything. But we do monitor every execution of S trace, every kernel module being loaded, every fail of a kernel module loading. It is actually a very interesting message on the kernel log. Uh, we monitor someone writing to various parts of the system. Every execution is monitored and so on and so forth. We collect a lot of data. Mm, we wrote this R system of hooked yet, which is a short binary that you should start on your system. It will detect 99% of the user space root kits out there. It, there might be some input necessary from the system administrator to understand the output, but it will tell you if you are, uh, if you have a backdoor on a user level running in your system. And there are also like big items like a full forensics and stuff. You can do it. Uh, uh, every rootkit has to communicate. So what we do, we intercept and lock every call to system calls like listen and socket. So when someone opens a new socket on our systems, we lock this message. When someone listens on our system, we lock this message. Uh, we look for programs doing calls to set the interface in a promiscuous mode. When something does not, we also lock every creation of the raw socket, which is used for constructing and sending arbitrary uh, data, sending ICMP out and uh, sniffing uh, network traffic on the interface level. There should be only a very narrow set of demons. And after profiling this alert for a while, for like two weeks, you will have a white list what to exclude. And then you can start work alerting on new binary that I have never seen uh, uh, started opening raw sockets. So I think you should go grab this. Like this is, these are our rules with our ODD uh, configuration. There is also a plugin and information how to put this kind of detection together. Uh, just to mention at the very end, again, look for patterns in your hunting. Uh, what really helped was anomaly detection on the geo level. So someone alert, we have an alert that tells me if I log in from here, Krakow, and then Moscow within like two hours. There is no way I can go to Moscow from here in two hours, but there is a way for my credentials to go to Moscow in two hours and be used from that. Uh, we monitor creation and modif modification of any user and group. Uh, and we try to not destroy the evidence anymore. Uh, questions, Polish, English, I will translate from Polish if someone wants to. Slides will be online, there will be links to go through this data on your own. Uh, thank you, I am ready to take questions.